The news gets even better for Australia. This is a dry continent and our plants spend a lot of their lives being water stressed. In a world of higher atmospheric carbon dioxide, our crops will use less water per unit of carbon dioxide uptake. It's not all good news. We will need this increase in agricultural productivity to offset the colder weather coming. It also follows that if it, the industrialised countries of the world want to be caring and sharing to the third world, the best thing that could be done for the third world is to increase atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. Who would want to deny the third world such a wonderful benefit? What I've shown in this presentation is that carbon dioxide is largely irrelevant to the Earth's climate. The carbon dioxide that mankind will put into the atmosphere over the next few hundred years will offset a couple of millennia of post-Holocene optimum cooling before we plunge into the next ice age. There are no deleterious consequences of higher atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. Higher atmospheric carbon dioxide levels are wholly beneficial. <coughs> Anthropogenic global warming is so minuscule that the effect cannot be measured from year to year and even from generation to generation. Our generation has bathed in the warm glow of a benign giving sun, but the next will suffer a sun that is less giving and the earth will be less fruitful. I completely agree with you and I enjoyed your analysis. And I'm answering Andrew McIntyre's point, why is it that the world doesn't fall over and say, well, this is obvious, it's all right? It's because it's only an empirical relationship. Yeah. And a lot of physicists will just not accept it's a respectable argument until you can demonstrate the cause. And their worry is, we've got 300 years of literature where people have speculated in all sorts of crazy ways about relationships between sunspots and this, that, or the other. Stock exchange, for example, weak crops. And so there's an element of disreputability, scientifically, seem to be associated with the very argument you've put. Don't be put off, keep putting it. <laughs> <laughs> To uh, Bob comments before, where we're saying the problem with the solar connection is, is it's based on, on data, empirical data, actual data, uh, and has historically lacked the mechanism, although there are a number of studies which are pointing towards very feasible mechanisms. But that's only actually half the problem. The other problem is the IPCC. IPCC take the other extreme where they build physics based models and uh, tend not to look at any data that doesn't agree with them. Too well. So I mean I think that's why you've got this um, uh, this this conflict, I guess. You you're really talking about two very different philosophies. If you if, if you were to ask, I guess most people in this room which one you prefer, models or data, I think uh, I think they would agree with me. It's got to be data first. Could I go back to one of your very original graphs, the quality data, satellite data? That one, yeah. I had understood that there were problems with the satellite data, the balloons weren't kind of giving the right answers, that there'd been corrections to that, and that the corrections really rather confirmed the IPCC position about how much warming there's been. Am I right? Or am I? No, you're completely wrong. Yes. Yeah. There were corrections made in the satellites, but the, the, it's good and agreed with the balloon data. Yeah. Right. This data is now agreed. Is that what you're saying? It's, it's good data, is what I'm saying. I see. There was a slight drift in a couple of the satellites. That's been corrected. And also this data agrees with the balloon data. Right, so it's all post that problem. Yes. Yeah. Internally consistent. Yeah. There's been a new attempt to contest the data. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Vincent Gray has just published a paper in Energy and Environment, which I can send to you, which it starts off by saying what has been done is um, untruthful.